New reporting over at The Intercept reveals that Pfizer has launched a lobbying campaign to take down legislation trying to make it easier for whistleblowers to hold companies liable for corporate fraud. The False Claims Act, a Civil War era law, allocates financial rewards for whistleblowers who file anti-fraud lawsuits against contractors on behalf of the government. Pfizer is specifically seeking to block a bipartisan push to fortify the older law with new legislation called the False Claims Amendments Act of 2021. Lee Fang reports that in 2009, Pfizer paid $2.3 billion in fines to settle allegations that the corporation, quote, illegally marketed several drugs for off-label purposes, specifically not approved by the FDA. That original lawsuit was filed under the False Claims Act. Team Rising is here to weigh in. Jennifer Holdsworth Karp is a Democratic strategist and owner of JC Strategies. Rachel Bovard is the policy director at the Conservative Partnership Institute. Glad to have you both with us. Good morning. Good morning. So, Rachel, tell us more, uh, if you can, about this law and, and why Pfizer is lobbying against it. <laughs> well, I'm not an expert in the law's construction, but, you know, I think the summation is that it actually gives an existing statute far more teeth. It allows, you know, whistleblower claims to be brought more easily, and it prevents the companies from tarring and feathering, as it were, you know, whistleblowers who do this. And, you know, I think in the wake of particularly what's going on with the Sackler family and the opioid crisis and the history of how that unfolded, I think it does give a lot of credence to the idea that we do need a little bit more accountability within these companies. Again, going back to the Sackler example, you saw, you know, numerous really troubling examples of corruption, you know, within the regulating agencies themselves, sort of a self-dealing aspect between people that were working in the regulating agencies and then going to work uh, for the big pharma companies. And so, you know, I think given all of the attention on, you know, not just the pharmaceutical industry, but broad major industry, I think Chuck Grassley has spoken specifically about defense contractors, then yes, I think maybe there is a, a lot of argument here to put some more transparency and give a little bit more muscle to a law that's, again, been on the books for a while, but perhaps needs some updating. Yeah, and, and Jennifer, it's, it's, it's an interesting interplay between the courts and, and the legislature here, because it really is a, a brilliant law, the way it was written. You know, the uh, Civil War era saw a lot of really interesting laws be produced. And this one says, OK, how are we going to find out if this contractor is bilking the government? And, they're like, and they come up with this very elegant solution that if, you know, somebody inside the company sees that their company is bilking the government, they get a, they get a cut of it. You know, if you, if you can prove that your company's robbing us, you get a cut. And lo and behold, that motivated a lot of people to come forward with claims that said, hey, my boss is ripping you off and I'll take 10 percent of what they of what they stole. Uh, over the years, over the last 10, 15 years, the courts have really s stripped the teeth out of this law and have said that, look, if the federal government continues to work with this contractor uh, after the fraud you know, has been raised, then the federal government didn't really care about the fraud. So therefore, it's not fraud, and therefore, the claim gets tossed out. It's, it's, an, it's absurd, and it, and it misunderstands the way that power works in Washington. Of course, the government is going to keep paying Halliburton, even if it's defrauding it. You know, that's, the, that's the point. So what this law would do is to say, no, like fraud is fraud. Uh, so, uh, Jennifer, what's, what's your sense of whether, whether or not there's enough you know, momentum behind this idea uh, that we could see this actually become law? Uh, I don't think there is enough momentum behind it, but I think there should be. And I think that uh, a lot of folks are going to start getting some real pressure on the Hill to make sure this is passed. The, the court case that uh, uh, essentially established materiality, which is what you were referring to, if uh, the fraud isn't material to the contract that is ongoing with the government because they're continuing to pay them, well, then it must not have been that important. And therefore, um, you know, they don't have to pay it. They don't have to, you know, they don't have to dismiss the contract. But he, I think we're missing for the forest, the forest for the trees here. Now, obviously, this is very, very focused on uh, pharma, considering what's happening with Pfizer right now. But more broadly, you know, civil penalties and fines that companies are paying are not having the intended consequences that we collectively want them to have. Sure, they pay them out of pocket. Their stock price takes a hit for a couple of days. The executives that perpetrated the fraud already have their millions in the bank and they move forward. There's no criminal penalties for 
any of the company leaders in any of the industries that are doing this and that are perpetrating it against the government. In fact, it's the money and the fines that they're paying are not even coming out of their pocket. It's coming away from their shareholders and, and, and their company's bottom line. So the way this is set up is entirely wrong more broadly, but specifically around uh, this particular law. Um, I think it's very interesting that's it, that it's fully bipartisan, and I believe that it passed out of the Judiciary, Judiciary Committee with something like 15 to 7, which is very unusual these days in terms of how we can collectively agree on an issue. So I think you're going to see more pressure moving forward for that materiality piece to be taken out of this, uh, uh, out of this law. Uh, Rachel, how should uh, the right you know, navigate these issues because, you know, historically there, well, at least in recent history, maybe not in, in going further back, but in recent history, there's been a friendliness toward, uh, toward businesses and toward corporations on the right. Um, and we, you know, we don't, I think, want to de demonize uh, pharmaceutical companies that are inventing great things like vaccines that are very important for us. But at the same time, the, you know, the, when there's, fraud going on when, when the federal government and uh, then by extension the American taxpayers are being defrauded when, you know, there's, there's bad behavior, at, as when we know that there is, um, that needs to be called out and that needs to be addressed. Or sh should it be addressed? I think the right, you know, has for the last 20 years or 30 years or so been in this position of thinking, you know, that they're, the business owner, you know, and to some extent, this, they're right about the small business owner is their constituency. But these big mega corporations, you know, that are sort of sprawling multinationals, there does need to be, I think, more policing that goes on, especially with how they do business with the government. I mean, the right starts from the premise that the government, you know, necessarily at some point is going to engage in some corruption. So why is it so hard to think that a business, you know, especially a large one doing business, with the government is immune to that. I mean, it's it's clearly the opposite. And I think also kind of going to Ryan's comment about how this law is constructed, it sort of plays to the impulse that we always talk about, right? We say, look, self-interest makes the market go round. Well, why can't self-interest help us root out fraud? Um, it reminds me actually, when I was working for uh, Senator Paul, he introduced similar legislation that actually uh, benefited federal employees for proposing efficiency measures within the mm -hmm. government. They would get paid yes, for doing exactly. that. So, yeah, there is there is sort of an impulse on the right that I think this law inhibit or uh, prohib allows that I think would be good here. And the upside is that Chuck Grassley, who was a co-sponsor of this, I believe, drafted the initial Civil War Civil War era law. <laughs> <laughs> more no uh, more bashing of it. We are so ageist on this show. It's getting no, worse every day. Largely fueled Ryan. by me and my anti elderly agenda. But I'm hearing he was only a staffer at that time. Okay, well. Okay. <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, Jennifer, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks, guys. And we will have more Rising right after this.